Okay, members, it's uh, now time for questions to the Executive Office. I call Ms Nicola Brogan. Nicola Brogan. Um, question number one, please. First Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, with your permission, I will answer questions 1 and 11 together. I am pleased to say that we continue to make good progress in our pathways out of restriction. At the Executive meeting on the 13th of May, we made decisions on the further reopening of our economy and society as part of our formal review of the pathway. We had good news for those with marriage and civil partnerships planned, the hospitality sector, and for those looking forward to visiting with their friends and families in private homes, and for those needing a hug. The COVID data continues to have a generally positive direction of travel, and we look forward to ratifying those decisions on the 20th of May, subject to an update on the public health situation. While the review process does allow the executive the flexibility to move rapidly on emerging priorities, the next major review point will take place on the 10th of June. This will allow for data on a range of health and societal impacts to be monitored and assessed before consideration is given to what further relaxations can be made safely. Supplementary, Nicola Brogan. I would like to thank the, um, the Joint First Minister for her answer. Um, given the disproportionate effect of the pandemic on the most vulnerable in our society, does the Minister agree that the Executive's recovery strategy should focus on addressing social inequalities as we emerge from the pandemic? I thank the member for her question, and uh, as she's probably aware, the task force is looking at economic recovery, but it's also looking at societal recovery. And we've always said that if we can do things better after the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, then we should take the opportunity to do that. Uh, and the task force will work with the lead departments uh, in those areas, obviously the Department for the Economy in terms of economic recovery, but the other departments as well involved in health inequalities, involved in uh, societal uh, inequalities, our own colleague, the DFC Minister, will be very much involved in all of those discussions as well. So this is a, something that we're working on uh, in the Executive at present, and certainly I hope that we can build back better. Thank you. And uh, Harry Harvey, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First Minister, can you give any indication on the time frame for the resumption of foreign travel? Thank you. Well, in terms of international travel, uh, Mr. Speaker, currently the requirements in place for international travel travellers vary according to whether they are arriving from a green, amber, or a red country. Red countries are those which the Joint Biosecurity Council have assessed as being particularly concerning. Uh, in terms of prevalence of variants, including, of course, the Indian variant. Uh, arrivals from red countries must book a managed isolation package prior to arrival and spend 10 days in a hotel after they arrive in Northern Ireland. And India, of course, is on uh, the Northern Ireland red list. Those arriving from amber countries must book and take a postal arrival test at days two and day eight and must self-isolate at home for 10 days from their arrival. Well, green countries are those from JBC have assessed a low risk and arrivals to Northern Ireland from green countries do not need to self-isolate or enter managed isolation either. They must book and take a, a day two test. Um, and Northern Ireland currently do not have any countries on its green list and the executive is currently considering the most appropriate list for Northern Ireland and I very much hope we will be able to have an outcome in relation to that this week. Thank you, Nicole. Colin McGrath. Um, many businesses, especially those in the hospitality sector, faced significant problems when they reopened after spending tens of thousands of pounds to get ready, only to find out that they didn't meet some established criteria. Um, would the First Minister be able to detail, is there any proactive work that's been undertaken to help sectors as they become permitted to open up to try and help and ensure that they meet any criteria prior to the opening date and then been told very quickly that they have to close down? I think the member is probably referring to the outdoor hospitality uh, issue when there was uh, some uh, issues raised with us directly. Uh, actually, the regulations hadn't changed from last year, uh, but I think the difference was that there were some council perhaps taking a more proactive approach to uh, enforcement, so things that shouldn't have been happening last year, but a blind eye was turned and no enforcement happened. Uh, this year, uh, enforcement did happen, and then unfortunately, uh, some of our hospitality um, organisations 
uh, having spent a lot of money, and we absolutely understand that, uh, felt that they could not open because they were in breach of the regulation. So therefore, there is a very much an important emphasis on engagement. Uh, Deputy First Minister and I met with uh, Hospitality Ulster and the Hotels Federation uh, last Thursday to again discuss these issues coming up to next Monday, uh, which is when we are hoping we will open the indoor hospitality. Of course, we're confirming that this Thursday. Uh, we are keeping a very close eye, Mr Speaker, and I'm sure the Chair would want us to, on the Indian variant uh, and the fact that we are concerned about what we see uh, in England, Scotland and Wales at present. We are here in Northern Ireland. There's no evidence of significant community transmission. Uh, we're very pleased about that and we want to keep that the case. Uh, so we will listen to our advisers this Thursday to hear what they have to say in relation to all of those issues. Thank you. I call Jim Allister. Given the approach of the 12th of July celebrations in this centenary year, and given the very long lead-in organisationally, what certainty and guidance can be given to those organising those demonstrations? I think that's a very good point and one that I raised uh, just last week um, because I think it is important that people have a very clear vision as to what's happening before uh, the 12th of July celebrations. I do pay tribute to the organisations last year for the way in which they conducted themselves and absolutely abided by the regulations, being quite innovative. Uh, I'm sure he'll remember the 12th at Home initiative uh, and all of those things. Um, I'm hoping to meet with Grand Orange Lodge along with the Health Minister in the very near future to discuss these issues, to see what is possible uh, in July, uh, because I think it is very important that people are able to have their cultural expression, but obviously in a safe way, and that's what we want to ensure. Oh, Paula Bradshaw. And First Minister, thank you for your answer so far. And I'd just like to place on record my thanks for all your work during the COVID pandemic at, at the executive table. Um, my question relates to um, the um, service stations um, up and down our motorways, and I appreciate why the executive allowed them to remain open for indoor dining. However, what we're hearing, obviously, from the contact tracing services, is that there's a potential for some um, transmission there. From the 24th, are you intending to introduce the contact tracing um, um, provisions that will be on all other restaurants going forward? Thank you. Well, we will want to see contact tracing, uh, and this is something that the Deputy First Minister and I discussed uh, with the hospitality sector last week. We want to make sure that it's uh, very much fit for purpose, so that if people do come in uh, for a meal or for a drink, that all of those contact tracing uh, pieces are in place so that if there is an unfortunate outbreak that we will be able to trace it very quickly and get to everyone else that is near to them or it has, is at a risk. Uh, this issue again was discussed at the Executive last week because colleagues were concerned um, that some people are actually driving to service stations for a meal. Um, <laughs> And uh, I found it quite interesting myself. But anyway, um, this is apparently what's happening. Um, that people are so desperate to get out for a meal that they're going to a service station and sitting in the service station. Of course, that's not what it was designed to do. Uh, it was designed to allow truck drivers and people who ordinarily would not have access uh, to those services uh, to be able to continue to do that within the service station. So sometimes when these laws are made, uh, the mischief... The purpose behind them gets stretched, uh, and I think this is a very good example of the purpose behind the reason getting very, very stretched. Thank you. Next question, the call to your Dixon. To you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the Travel Agents Financial Assistance Scheme was agreed by the Executive to ensure the continued viability of the travel agency sector here. The scheme is intended to help vulnerable but viable travel agents, including self employed home workers, with the cost of reopening or keeping a business operational, with the cost of reconnecting with employees and customers, and adapting customer marketing, and the cost of financial planning. A viable travel agents industry is critical to support a return to normal and build confidence that travel agents and other retail businesses will continue to be a feature of our high streets. The payments for the scheme should make a significant contribution to the continued viability of the sector here. The scheme was open for application from the 19th to the 26th of March 2021, 
Officials within TEO are currently processing 187 applications. It is anticipated that payments will be made to successful applicants in early summer. It is expected that the scheme will provide in the region of £1.1 to £1.3 million of much-needed support for this sector. Final costs will be known once all applications have been processed. Supplementary, Stuart Dixon. Thank you very much, First Minister, and indeed uh, thank you very much on behalf of those uh, travel agents who will ultimately benefit from this and it, its much-needed support. But a question that is coming through from travel agents today, and we recognise the value of them to the economy of Northern Ireland, is that because their counterparts in the rest of the UK will be using uh, effectively the NHS app to prove uh, that their clients have received vaccination. The NHS app is not available to them here in Northern Ireland, yet most travel booking that is done through travel agents, and therefore the business which they do, is done on a UK-wide basis. But if an online app is not available in Northern Ireland, what alternative do you and your office have uh, to, to provide for that, for those citizens who wish to travel? I thank the member for his question. And, and, and actually, England and Wales, the app speaks uh, to each other, but in Scotland it doesn't as well. So Scotland, Northern Ireland, there is a, a, an issue. And uh, it's something that we have discussed um, with the other devolved administrations, as you would expect. Um, under uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. We speak every week uh, around some of the upcoming difficulties. Um, uh, and what they're looking at is, in the short term, having a paper uh, trail. So if you've had your um, vaccination, and not just a letter, but obviously something that's compliant with um, safety rules, data protection rules, to make sure that uh, uh, there isn't any fraud going on and that you don't just turn up with a letter that somebody has typed out for you from, from your office, as it were. So th there's a lot of work going into data protection and cyber security issues around that. Um, and we'll probably get an update on that this week. Uh, but Scotland has a similar problem to ourselves, uh, and therefore we need to get the apps to speak to each other. And I know that, so there's work going on on the alternative, i.e. the paper alternative, but then there's also work going on on the digital piece to see if we can get the apps all connected to each other, because they are meant to speak to each other. So when I go across to England, I should be able to use the Northern Ireland app in England. So why can't we get it to work uh, in terms of this COVID certification as well. So there's, there is work going on. I want to assure uh, the member that that is happening. Call Melissa McHugh. Con Corla. Uh, and, uh, Minister, thank you for your answers to date as well. Uh, uh, in terms of travel and tourism, I can totally understand how it has suffered so much, and I appreciate the emphasis that has been placed on travel and tourism in particular. But so many other industries and businesses as well uh, have suffered throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, can you provide for us as part of uh, the, a response to the pandemic whatever financial assistance is there now in place for other industries? Well, I'm certainly uh, happy to get the office to write to you with the um, full range of assistance that there is. Obviously, there is the COVID localised support scheme still in place until such times as uh, hospitality is open in full again. Um, but as I say, um, there are probably ones that I don't know about that the part Department of the Economy has, so I would rather write to you and give you uh, a more substantive answer so that you have all of the schemes in front of you. Thank you. And I call Daniel McCross. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for the answers to questions so far. Uh, question three, First Minister. Question th three. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I shall answer questions three, ten, and thirteen together. Uh, the first meeting of the task force took place on the 23rd of February, chaired by the junior ministers. The task force formally adopted its terms of reference and the vision of quote, sustainable city, town, and village centres, which are thriving places for people to do business, socialise, shop, be creative, and use public services, as well as being great places to live. End quote. Since then, four subgroups have been established on influencing policy and strategy, promoting the development of capacity, developing and promoting good practice, and influencing and shaping intervention and investment. Meetings of the subgroups are being arranged to initiate the formal projects for each of the key functions and a programme of comprehensive engagement and co-design with stakeholders. 
Recommendations for future action will be developed in due course. Restoring the vibrancy of our high streets will take a number of phases over a period of years. As we emerge from the lockdown, the immediate priority is the opening up of our high streets and the rolling out of a COVID recovery strategy. That, that is the focus of the Executive COVID Task Force, headed by the Interim Head of the Civil Service. The High Streets Task Force will have a longer term focus addressing the fundamental need for transformation of our high streets in response to fundamental societal and economic changes. In relation to membership of the task force, the key to success is co design and co delivery, drawing in the skills of business and other sectors to shape transformation. The breadth of the membership reflects the breadth of the challenge. Whilst the membership is large, the governance arrangements of subgroups, each with a key function, will provide a basis for efficient and effective working. Supplementary, Daniel McCross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for the answer to the question. Uh, First Minister, many of the sectors represented on the task force are unhappy about the fact that within a 90-minute meeting, 20 sectors are vying to have their voices heard. Uh, I note that you have said that there are various subgroups set up, and I welcome that. But what will you do, Minister, to ensure that the task force is able to engage effectively? Well, I, I note what the member says, and the unfortunate thing about this is trying to find a balance because uh, I have stood here and uh, in the committee, and I have been challenged about the fact that X council hasn't been involved or Y council hasn't been involved, uh, and that such and such a sector needs to be involved. So we've tried to have a balance in the overall um, high street task force, but we have split it up into these four separate subgroups in the hope that we can have a more focused look at those, and the subgroups can bring people on and, and consult people uh, about the best way forward in relation to those uh, particular issues. Uh, the High Street and the recovery of the High Street is multi-layered, there is no doubt about that. We have always had this issue, um, well, we have had this issue now for a couple of years about the High Street and the challenges to the High Street. Obviously, COVID has then come along and has exacerbated that, accelerated some of the problems that uh, High Streets are facing. Uh, and therefore, it, we do need to have a very focused look at what is the future of our high streets in Northern Ireland, whether you're in a village or in a town or in, in one of our cities. So we have set out an ambitious plan. Uh, we ask people to bear with us and to work with us because I think this has the capacity uh, to bring forward a vision for Northern Ireland uh, that is different, that is ours, and I think that's right. We should have our own uh, vision here, uh, but we'll look at other examples in Scotland, England and Wales as well to see that we're doing and going on the right track. Keep Archibald. Margaret uh, Cancordia and I thank the Minister for her responses so far um, and Minister as you've outlined out there yourself there's going to be no one size fits all um, solution to issues faced by the high streets. Um, do you therefore agree that it's important that there is that targeted engagement and you've outlined through the subgroups uh, with particular regard to our smaller towns and villages um, to ensure that there is that what is needed to uh, revitalise and regenerate going forward? Margaret. Yeah, I thank the member for her question. That's exactly what we want to see happening. And I know uh, sometimes some of our local councils feel that they need to be a stakeholder in the group to be able to contribute. I hope that they're looking at this in a more holistic way, that they recognise that this is a, a subject that sits within TEO, but actually goes right across government, right across all of the departments, uh, and indeed uh, all of local government as well, and the businesses. And that's why we have those business representatives on, so that they can bring their experiences and what they want to see happening uh, on the high streets as well. So I hope it will be a focused engagement, but one that will deliver real and tangible results, because as I've said, this has been going on for a number of years now, and we really need to grapple with it. Nicola Palm Cameron. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, with your indulgence, I would like to take this opportunity just to put on record uh, my thanks to my friend and the First Minister for her love and commitment to Northern Ireland, for her dedication and incredible work ethic, not least throughout this past very difficult year. Um, in regards to uh, the answers to the questions regarding the, the very important work of the High Street Task Force. Does uh, the First Minister agree that the work of this task force will need to continue well into the future, um, as the periods of lengthy closures and the ending of furlough will have long-lasting impact on our recovery? 
So I thank the member for her kind words and um, uh, absolutely will miss uh, working with her uh, in the Assembly. Um, can I say to her that uh, given its strategic role, uh, we have established that the task force uh, will probably be in existence for an initial period of five years um, with an expectation of a review of its performance early uh, in the next Assembly mandate so that we can see where we have uh, got to by uh, probably this time next year. Uh, Mr Speaker, so it is important that we realise that this just isn't a quick fix. Uh, it's something that will continue for a period of time uh, and I think that that's important because our High Street doesn't just want us to come in, look at it, suggest a few things and then leave again. They want us to continue to work with them uh, in trying to develop uh, the High Streets for the future. So initial period of five years, Mr Speaker. Thank you. And I call uh, Orlea Flynn. Good. I can call you. Um, thank the Minister for her answer. Um, and the First Minister, you did outline um, some of the issues that were already facing the high streets even pre pandemic. Um, and I think it's great all of the work that the task force is um, carrying out. But I'm wondering, does the First Minister have any update um, on another important initiative um, to help support the high streets, which is the high street stimulus scheme? If there's any update on that, thank you. Well, of course, and I thank the member for her question. This is a, a stimulus scheme that will be brought forward by the Department for the Economy. Uh, we had hoped that that would have been able to have been rolled out faster uh, than what we are doing now, but there is no point in, in putting out a stimulus scheme until we were fully open, um, because the experience of going to our high street is, of course, enhanced uh, by the fact that you can go and have lunch, you can go and have a coffee, you can go and have a drink, uh, and until next Monday, uh, that hasn't been possible in an indoor setting. So I'm sure that the Minister for the Economy will want to come forward uh, in the near future with the High Street uh, uh, stimulus scheme because it's something that we hope will ha make a real difference to those people who have had such a terrible year. 2020-2021 uh, will not be seen as a good year uh, for our high streets, but I hope that we can help them to get on an even footing again. Thank you. And Irma or Patsy McGlone, I call Patsy McGlone. Irma, I to call you cash to your Question number four. We are committed to the development and implementation of the rights, language and identity proposals contained in New Decade, New Approach. It has always been our intention to progress these proposals during this mandate and to create the relevant bodies as quickly as possible thereafter. We will keep the Assembly updated on our progress. Okay, Stella, okay, uh, thanks very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, I would just like to take this opportunity. Um, I, I have, as the Minister will be well aware, worked with the Minister in different roles uh, at different departments uh, throughout all that. Now, we agreed on many things and maybe differed occasionally, but I would like to take this occasion to put it on the record uh, to wish her and her family well in the times ahead. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> just in regard to the supplementary, um, given the Culture and Language Bill uh, was part of the bedrock of the new decade, new approach, will the Minister give assurances that it is not being used as a political bargaining chip? Thank you. Thank the member for his question and indeed his, his kind words, which he's already uh, communicated to me, and I thank him for that. Um, as the member knows, there are many things in New Decade New Approach that should have moved on um, by now. Uh, progress on health transformation, having more police officers on the ground, uh, down to very technical issues like moving to three cycles of IVF instead of just two. So there are a number of issues that haven't been able to progress. Uh, and I think we all know the reason for that. It's in terms uh, of COVID-19. Um, but he should know that uh, we are committed, as I've said in the answer, to the development and implementation of all of the commitments in uh, New Decade, New Approach. And I'm sure that those will progress now uh, that we are hopefully moving into a better place in relation to COVID-19. I call Doug Beatty. Mr Speaker, uh, First Minister, I won't labour, but, but thank you for... Uh, your leadership as our, as our First Minister. Of course, um, we all have disagreements, but what we can honestly believe is that you wanted to do the best uh, for this part of the United Kingdom, and I thank you for that. Just to follow up on, the, on that question, um, First Minister, will this go through a full legislative process? Uh, and is there an expectation, and, and maybe you're doubling back on yourself, but is there an expectation that we'll get royal assent before the end of the, the, the man, mandate? 
Well, first of all, can I say to him many congratulations as he takes on the role as leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, I want to pay tribute to, and this is the first time I've been in the House since his predecessor uh, stepped down, and uh, I wish Steve well as he moves away from the pressures and challenges uh, of leadership, uh, as we all do. <laughs> and uh, I hope that uh, he enjoys being on the back bench uh, now. But congratulations to you, Doug, and I, I hope you enjoy uh, your time uh, as leader. Um, I mean, in terms of getting royal assent by the end of this mandate. That was, of course, uh, the intent when we agreed new decade, new approach, that, that would be uh, the way forward. Uh, obviously, it will be for others now to push ahead in relation to all of the um, promises uh, in new decade, new approach, and therefore those will move ahead according to uh, their timetable. But I just want to be very clear, as I said in my resignation speech, you know, here in Northern Ireland there are people here who are British, other who are Irish, other who are Northern Irish. Then we have a mixture of all three, um, and of course we have our new and emerging community uh, as well. But we must all learn uh, to be generous uh, to each other, to live together, and to share this wonderful country that we are all so privileged to represent here in uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly. So that's certainly my belief, uh, and I hope it's the belief of everyone in this Assembly, if we are to move forward, we cannot keep looking backwards, because the future for Northern Ireland will not be found in division, but instead in sharing this place that we all call home. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I call Sinead Annas. I can call you. Um, does the Minister agree with me that New Decade New Approach was the basis on which these institutions were re-established, and that we need to see full delivery on the commitments uh, contained within NDNA by the Executive and by this Assembly, but also crucially by the British and Irish governments? Uh, yes, um, we do need to see delivery from all of those involved uh, in the New Decade New Approach um, discussions. Um, that was the idea behind it. It was a comprehensive uh, agreement. It was one that brought us back in here again. I do agree with her uh, in relation to that. So, therefore, it is now uh, for those involved um, to make sure that that moves ahead, whether it is the, uh, our own government, uh, the Irish government, or indeed people in the executive as well. It's for them to progress and to move ahead in a new decade, new approach. I call Jim Allister. I think that we have seen delivery under a new decade, new approach of the commitment to utterly unfettered trade from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, and in respect of any legislation, though it is probably now a matter for her successor, can she confirm for the public's information that no legislation can be brought, no government legislation can be brought to this House without the consent of the uh, First Minister and the Executive, and therefore without the personal endorsement of people in that position? So, just to the last point, obviously. Um any um, legislation that comes to the floor of the House from the Executive has the endorsement of the Executive, has the endorsement of the First and Deputy First Minister, just to confirm that that is the case. Um, to his point uh, around unfettered access, of course all of the promises that were made about unfettered access have not been uh, held up. Um, what we are seeing now uh, is actually the opposite. We are seeing fettered um, trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and I hope that the legal case which he and I are both involved in will bring an end to that and will bring some clarity in relation to trade, which of course was set out uh, in the Act of Union uh, back in 1800, and we hope that that will be the case. Okay, Mr Speaker, with your permission, Junior Minister Lyons will answer this question. Uh, Mr Speaker, in 2021, funding of over £18 million was allocated to Good Relations by the Executive Office. This includes £12 million of shared future funding, which was allocated across departments for the delivery of the seven TBUC headline actions and wider Good Relations programmes. A further £6.6 million of Executive Office baseline funding was allocated to Good Relations Delivery, supporting programmes such as the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, the District Council Good Relations Programme, and funding for the Community Relations Council. And that ends the period for a list of questions. And we move now to topical questions for 15 minutes. And I call Sinead Bradley. 
Speaker. Um, could I ask, please, for an update on progress and the anticipated timeline for reporting on the Truth and Recovery Design Team, who are charged with establishing the terms of reference for the victims um, centred around the mother and baby homes? I thank the member for her question. She will know that um, that work has been taken forward by Judith Gillespie and her team. They have set up a panel now with a number of experts uh, to engage uh, with the victims so that they can moderate it in a way that is truly co-designed for the future. Um, We are looking forward to engaging with Judith again to get an update in relation to that work that is ongoing. Um, Unless she is going to tell me otherwise, no huge concerns have been raised with me around that process, uh, and I hope that it will bring forward uh, an inquiry of whatever type um, that the victims want and the victims need. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the First Minister for her answer. But I think it is fair to presume, and we know, that a lot of the truth and the answers to the truth lie in documents and data held by other parties. Can I therefore ask what actions have the First and Deputy First Minister, preliminary actions have you taken to secure that data? And unfortunately, also there may be a requirement to secure land. Yes, well, we have had initial discussions uh, with some of the church leaders, um, with some of the institutional uh, leaders. We, those were preliminary discussions around the scope of what we were trying to do, um, as well as data that is held here and, of course, will be uh, protected if it is held within our government departments, as you will know. Uh, we will also listen very carefully to what the Interdepartmental Working Group has to say about access to documents outside the jurisdiction because she will know that there uh, is a great degree of concern around access to documents in the Republic of Ireland, for example, um, and we will want to hear what the recommendations are around that. I think that Judith is engaging with her colleagues in the Republic of Ireland to try and tease out some of those issues at present, um, but we will want to see all of those documents made available so that people can get the truth and that they can find out what happened during those terrible years. Thank you. Uh, Eremar Colm Gillernu, I call Colm Gillernu. Gormay Agat, Cian Corlea. Um, can I ask the First Minister to outline the impact of the Together Building a United Community Strategy in tackling sectarianism and division? Gormay This has been a, a long-standing strategy, uh, as a member will know, uh, from the Executive Office and before that from the Office of First and Deputy First Minister to try and tackle some of those um, legacy sectarian issues that persist within our society. And I have to say, I've been really pleased to see the way in which our young people engage with the TBUC uh, strategy and the programmes that are rolled out from that TBUC strategy, in particular the camps that are held uh, at an annual basis, and those are organised all around uh, Northern Ireland, bringing people together uh, who wouldn't ordinarily come together, uh, Mr Speaker. And I'm sure the members are aware of the good work that takes place, for example, in Erin East, uh, a very important part of Northern Ireland. Uh, I do declare an interest as my home DEA. Uh, and I think that the work that goes on there uh, is, is an example of the good work that TBUC has facilitated over many years. Okay, Stella, Colin Gillerney. I, I, I agree, I agree, Minister, that it is a crucial piece of work. And given that that is the case, um, that, that it is so crucial in terms of building a shared future and a better future indeed, can you detail how the impact of the programme is being, uh, in terms of interventions, are being assessed or measured at community level? Thank the member. So the delivery of the strategy is captured under um, an action under outcome 7, 9 and 10 of our outcomes development plan, which relates to a vision of a safe, welcoming and shared society that respects diversity and is a place where people want to work and invest. Uh, Progress towards achieving those outcomes is measured by a number of key indicators, uh, including increased for respect for each other, increased shared space and increased reconciliation. And results from the 2019 Northern Ireland Life and Time survey indicate that 66% of respondents believe facilities in their area are shared and open uh, to Protestants and Roman Catholics, while 62% agree or strongly agree that their own cultural identity is respected. So we're looking at Life and Time surveys, we're looking at those indicators to see that the programme is actually making an impact on the ground.
I call Morris Bradley. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, can I ask the First Minister what plans the Executive Office have to promote Northern Ireland's only enterprise zone in my constituency? As a member will know, that is more a matter for the Department for the Economy, uh, but I am quite happy to pass on his comments to the Minister, and I am sure she can respond to him in due course. Supplementary, Morris Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the First Minister for that answer. Uh, and maybe perhaps you could pass on to Invest DNI to show the same commitment the First Minister has had for East Londonderry, and perhaps visit my constituency a wee bit more often. Thank you. For Invest DNI, but I'm sure they will have heard what the members had to say in relation to that matter. I call Steve Egan. Indeed, and may I indeed uh, join my calls to the First Minister and wish her all the best for the future. And she now joins, joins a, quite an exclusive club of ex-unionist leaders and the rest of it. But we could all join together and have a bit of a pub crawl when everything opens up to get to that point. But First Minister, may I go to my question? It's, it was reported yesterday that Lord Frost said at his view that the protocol in its current form was not sustainable. Would the First Minister agree that the protocol is not working for anyone in Northern Ireland and is in fact destabilising? Well, I'm not sure that a pub crawl would be allowed under COVID restrictions, um, but uh, I thank him anyway for, for his comments. Uh, in terms of Lord Frost's comments, yes, I noted those comments uh, very much. Uh, it was notable that he has said that it's unsustainable and that they're not working for anyone, and he gave some good examples uh, as to what was happening here in Northern Ireland. Uh, I welcome his words. Now we need to see action. Uh, in relation to these issues, and I hope uh, that we will see action in the near future, uh, because we have seen uh, some very alarming stories recently, particularly in relation to cancer drugs, uh, and we want to get clarity in relation to those issues as soon as we possibly can. Supplementary, Steve Egan. I thank the First Minister for her answer so far, but I also to further to her remarks. Obviously, one of the significant issues we are having around is about medicines and medical devices and the likely impact that is going to be. Could she outline if she has had any discussions with the European Union and whether Marius Sefcovic has indeed identified that these are problems and things that need to be sorted out, or is he just ignoring the issue? Well, I think that the, after the newsletter story last Friday, the, um, the European Union did respond uh, and basically dismissed it and said it was not uh, an issue. Um, but uh, MHRA, which is responsible for uh, dealing with these issues in the United Kingdom, disagrees with them and actually says that it is an issue because uh, what um, the European Union is referring to uh, is just a grace period, and MHRA do not deal in grace periods. They deal with what is going to happen. Uh, therefore, I think it is right um, that this issue, in particular in relation to medicine, is only one issue, of course, and I think we all recognise that. Um, has to be a priority uh, because the, the, the well-being of the people of Northern Ireland depends on it. And I mean, cancer drugs, above all things, should not be held up in a political wrangle, uh, and therefore it needs to be dealt with very, very quickly. Nicole William Humphrey. Thank you, First Minister, for answer so far. Given the recent visit of Lord Frost in Northern Ireland, can the First Minister advise the House uh, if he recognised the huge difficulties in the obnoxious protocol? causing to Northern Ireland PLC and that that protocol is absolutely opposed by all unionists in Northern Ireland and it needs to be replaced? I thank the member for his question. I, I do indeed think that Lord Frost acknowledges uh, the political issues around this. He recognises that there is not one uh, unionist in favour of uh, the protocol and the way in which it has been implemented since the beginning of this year. I had the opportunity to briefly speak to him while he was here in Northern Ireland last Monday. Uh, he was meeting with businesses, he was listening to their very real concerns, and I think as a consequence of that, you have his comments of this weekend, uh, which set out very clearly that he thinks that something needs to happen. So let's see that happening, uh, so that instead of listening to words, we actually see action in relation to the protocol. Supplementary, William Humphrey. Thank the First Minister for the answer. Uh, First Minister, you will be aware of the attack on the city cemetery and the Jewish graveyard there a number of weeks ago. There is real concern within our small Jewish community in Northern Ireland about utterances of some politicians and some street activity. Can the First Minister join with me in providing real support to our small Jewish community, particularly in this city of Belfast? Well, I have to say to the member, I am very pleased he has brought this issue up. Um, I tweeted about this last night. I find anti-Semitism sickening. 
uh, especially uh, when it's directed to such a small community here in Northern Ireland, a vulnerable community because of their size. Uh, I noted uh, that one of our foremost business people had their premises defaced in a, a really awful way at the weekend. Uh, and I think it's incumbent upon every single person in this House, regardless of what they think of what is happening in the Middle East at present, to condemn and to be active in their condemnation of what is happening to our small Jewish community here in Northern Ireland. I find it sickening to the pit of my stomach, I have to say, that people would target uh, our Jewish community in that way. Uh, and I absolutely say to the member to please take my best wishes to the community, uh, particularly in North Belfast. Thank you. I call Dagna Magalier. Does the Minister have any indication of when the Peace, uh, the Peace Plus programme is likely to open for applications? Uh, no, we don't have an indication of that as yet. It's still in development. Um, uh, as he will know, the Department of Finance leads uh, on SEUPB matters, but the Deputy First Minister and I have met with the Chief Executive uh, in relation to the programme. It will be a very significant programme uh, for many communities right across Northern Ireland, uh, and we look forward to that in the near future. The Minister will appreciate that uh, previous EU funding programmes have had a huge trans transformative impact here in terms of promoting peace and prosperity. Does she have any assessment of the impact of previous programmes and indeed of the pending Peace Plus programme? Well, as I have indicated, uh, the Department of Finance leads uh, on the Peace Plus programme. Of course, the Deputy First Minister and I take a very great interest in it because often uh, it augments other programmes. And sometimes when we go to try and, and uh, help a community, it's a cocktail of funding that comes forward. But SEUPB are uh, sometimes the largest funder, and it is about transforming uh, the communities and dealing with some of the issues. Uh, Mr McAleer's colleague, uh, Mr Gildren, you referred to in relation to transforming societies through the T-Buck strategy. So we have indicated uh, to the Chief Executive that we would like it to be a transformative uh, piece of work right across Northern Ireland, and I hope he agrees that that is the way it should work. And I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <clears throat> Mr Speaker, at the outset, I hope that I am not sounding overcritical and considering that we have been in the middle of a pandemic. Could the First Minister enlighten us as to when we could see the hundreds of jobs as promised flowing from the former 760-acre Shackleton Barracks site, Ballykelly, in my East London area constituency? Well, as the member will know, and I think I have signed off a question to the member very recently in relation to this, this has uh, been slowed down by the fact that the Heathrow expansion has been stalled by a planning issue uh, in Heathrow. This development of Ballykelly was meant to be linked to the Heathrow expansion, uh, and unfortunately that is stalled at present, and I'm sure that that has an impact uh, in relation to the matters in which he refers. Supplementary, Mr Robinson. Thank the Minister for her answer. Um, could, I, could I ask the Minister if there is a clawback clause attached to the sale of the site? That is not detail I have in front of me, but I am happy that officials follow up with the member in relation to that issue. I call Harry Harvey. Deputy Speaker, First Minister, given the announcement last week that on the 24th of May non essential travel is allowed within the Commonwealth Travel Area, what steps are you taking to encourage those from GB to travel to NI to boost our tourism and hospitality sector? Well, sorry, in relation to travel within the CTA, uh, currently subject to advice and guidance, uh, we have decided to remove the essential travel reasons requirement and retain the guidance on self-isolation uh, and add two new exemptions to that. So um, now people are allowed to visit family and friends. We felt that that was a very important exemption, Mr Speaker, given the number of familial ties uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, and indeed, uh, many within the executive acknowledged that. Uh, and also there is an exemption to those who have already completed mandatory uh, quarantine on arrival at a point of entry elsewhere in the common travel area and then travel directly into Northern Ireland. So if you have already um, served your quarantine in London or Scotland, uh, then you can come on into Northern Ireland without needing more quarantine. Thank you. And time is up. Could members please take your ease for a moment or two?